Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the weekly briefing on the University of Arizona campus reentry. I'm Holly Jensen, Vice President of Communications here at the university. With us today is President Robert C. Robbins, President of the University of Arizona, and Dr. Richard Carmona, 17th Surgeon General of the United States and Distinguished Professor here at the university. As always, we'll take your questions at the bottom of the remarks. Please make sure you enter your name and news organization, and I'll take those questions in the order they were received. With that, I'll turn it over to you, President Robbins. Thank you, Ollie, and good morning, everyone. Nice, brisk morning here in Tucson. Thank you all for joining us yet again. We're almost to our break. Uh, this week, the week of November 23rd, we will continue with our in-person instruction for in-person and flex in-person courses with up to 50 students, if public health conditions allow. As we continue to prepare for both the holiday season and the spring semester, I'm pleased to report that our testing blitz has been successful so far, and it will continue until November 25th. We administered a total of 7,541 tests from Monday, November 9th to Sunday, November 13, with 65 positive cases identified. This is an increase of 1,927 tests administered from the previous week, a change of 34%. So we've increasing, increased our testing capacity for this blitz. 4,335 uh, of the tests administered this past week were for off-campus students. So we're getting our off-campus students motivated and agreeing to come in and test before uh, they potentially uh, leave campus with 2,302 for on-campus students and 904 employees. Students, faculty, and staff can test through the university's Test All Test Smart initiative. Visit covid19.arizona.edu forward slash COVID-19 testing. Friends and family of our students living in Pima County can test at several new locations set up by the county with no appointments necessary. Overall, the 85719 zip code, the rate of transmission has declined 
with the RT or R naught number dropping to 1.33, and that's down from about two last week. This is still obviously higher than we would like, but it is a significant improvement over last week when the number was over two, as I said. Data continues to be added to the university's dashboard every day, and, are, and I urge everyone to keep up to date with the latest facts about the university's re-entry there and on the COVID uh, response homepage at covid19.arizona.edu. We also have announced mandatory testing in the spring for all students who live on campus and come to campus for in-person in classes. Like most public universities nationwide, we cannot legally mandate testing for other students as a prerequisite for enrollment, such as those who live off campus and are, and are completing classes totally remotely. In this context, we need to remember that the number of non-traditional students enrolled at the University of Arizona continues to grow, and we have students who live in Tucson and Southern Arizona uh, who may work full time, have families and dependents, and for whom the student experience is different from what uh, we tend to imagine for our own campus students. These students are not necessarily coming onto our campus and therefore would not be required to mandatorily test. However, I will say the more testing we do, the better. As a reminder, we anticipate starting the spring semester in stage two in-person instruction for all essential courses, as well as for in-person and flex in-person for classes with projected classroom capacities of no more than 50 people essentially what we're doing right now, which, which is working very, very well. We are constantly evaluating data to ensure we move forward safely, and we will adjust plans if public health conditions ne uh, necessitate. Switching to some great news for the university, I want to highlight the amazing dedication ceremony we held for the new installation of flags from Arizona's 22 Native Nations. This display in the university bookstore where we have other national flags exhibited. This is an important step recognizing the sovereignty of the native nations in Arizona and signifies our commitment to work with, it, with them for the good of their students, our state and the university. I want to especially thank Chairman Ned Norris from the Tohono O'odham Nation and, for, and to Chairman uh, Peter Yucapicio from the Paskayaki tribe for joining us in person. All those from Arizona's other native nations who joined via live stream and our presidential events and university ceremonies team for putting on an incredible socially distanced hybrid event. In addition, our university alumni and development program ran an excellent virtual homecoming this weekend. The university's first ever day of giving resulted in over $1 million contributed by alumni and supporters in just over 24 hours, dedicated to supporting our students through scholarships, which during this time is greatly needed. And we were able to cap off homecoming with a great football game against USC because of our aggressive testing program and the bubble which is working for our student athletes. We had no positive tests from either team uh, in the Friday and Saturday testing, which I think is a uh, testament to the, the discipline and commitment of our student athletes. And our team performed well. I was impressed with how well they performed, even though the Trojans came back and won the game in a dramatic fashion at the last minute. Dr. Kimono will go through current data, but before he does, I want to remind everyone, cover your face, wash your hands, stay physically distanced, and listen to public health experts and officials. Rich, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, good morning, everybody. And once again, thank you for joining us uh, these many months for the updates. Um, before I get to the data and the slides, I just wanted to make an opening statement. Um, our nation is at a critical juncture now. Again, not only Pima County, not only the state of Arizona, cases are surging. If you look at the heat map across the United States, almost every state is in an orange or red color, which 
basically depicts rapidly rising cases. In the United States, over 11 million cases now, over a million deaths. This is catastrophic. And in order for this to be controlled, we must adhere to the best public health practices that the president continues to reiterate, the simple ones in our toolbox that are there now. That is uh, bear down, mask up, wash your hands, stay socially distanced, stay within your own family unit. Don't venture outside unless you absolutely have to. We all have to play our part to be able to diminish the transmissibility of this disorder, this disease. So pay attention to the data. Uh, we'll prevent, present some of that to you now, but remember Pima County is part of a bigger uh, entity, the state, a state that has well over 7 million people and a nation with 330 or 340 million people. And all of us are facing the same problems. We must come together as a nation with a national plan and stay focused. And that national plan is expressed differently in each community based on the incidence, prevalence of disease and so on. I know it's confusing. The president knows it's confusing. We both, you lose a lot of sleep over this as does our incident command system. We are in communication every single day, multiple times reviewing data and working to make sure that our campus is as safe as possible so our young men and women can come here and learn, but also that our faculty and staff are here safely and have confidence in the programs that we have put together. So again, this is a national emergency. Make no mistakes. This is the first time in over a century we have seen a pandemic and we are in the middle of it now. And every indication is that we are gonna have many more deaths, many more sick people. We're watching carefully how that's moving, especially as it relates to the resources we have in our community and the state of Arizona. So let's go to the first slide now, but I wanted to make sure that my remarks are put in context. So first and foremost to our students, you know this, we've repeated it many times. It's on a website we'll bring up again. You can go to the Dean of Students for more information if you have any, any kind of challenges or not sure of what to do. Fill out the Thanksgiving travel survey, participate in testing now through the November 25th and choose one of three travel options for your health and well-being. Next slide. Now, as we talk about these travel options, it is extraordinarily important that when you decide you're going to be traveling, that for the 10 days prior, you hunker down and stay in your residence and don't go out unless you absolutely have to for work, for a medical appointment, to get food, but do it safely. Wear your mask, stay socially distanced, wash your hands a lot. The reason we want you to stay sequestered as much as possible is because that limits transmissibility so that when you decide you're going to go home to mom and dad or grandma or grandpa or friends or family, wherever you go, we want to make sure you go without taking a virus inadvertently because we know that 40 or more percent of you may be asymptomatic. You may have the virus and we don't know for sure. So in order to minimize transmissibility, you staying in a safe zone as much as you can, following the travel options that we put up there, decreases the risk. Now, the president has said numerous times, we cannot eliminate risk, but we can certainly reduce risk by the practices we choose to use. Next slide. Here's that Earl again. If you have any questions at all, you wanna review any of the policies we have put out, at the University of Arizona, please go to this website and take a look. If you need any clarification, please contact us. Talk to the Dean of Students. We want to make sure you understand we've done everything we can to be transparent and provide health literate, culturally competent messaging so that you can act on that appropriately. Next slide. Concerning, again, as I've alluded to in my opening remarks, we see the rise in Arizona cases significantly going up. That graph on the right side continues to climb. This is pretty much what's happening in the rest of the nation. And you can see that our cases have gone up in the last uh, couple of days, really, to uh, almost 276,000 cases in the total that have been reported, an increase in 14-day change of 75%. 
That's very significant. Our deaths have increased as well, 29%, and we see hospitalizations going up 57%. Again, this is important because not only the University of Arizona, but we need to look at the entire county, the hospitals we have, the doctors, the nurses, the health staff, the beds, the ventilators, the ICU beds. We monitor those on a daily basis because as we go up and every other community is having these problems as well, resources become more scarce. And then we're put in a position where we have infinite needs and finite resources. Other communities in the United States are suffering. In Texas, New Mexico, they've started exporting patients, transferring them because their resources are depleted. The way to prevent that from happening is to practice the public health practices we talk about all the time, to be able to reduce transmissibility and keep our scarce resources available and keep people healthier. Last thing I'll mention on that, because this is the time of year where our snowbirds come in, the weather is beautiful, the community is a beautiful community. Often we see those snowbirds who tend to be older come and they get sick. And sometimes they need to go to a doctor and a hospital once in a while. For illnesses that have nothing to do with COVID, it might be the flu, it might be their own chronic diseases, but that's the normal. Now we're adding on top of that COVID. So it is very concerning to us. The president and I and the incident command system are very, very concerned about the resources that we need to keep open. The way you help us keep those resources available for those who need them is to decrease transmissibility do the public health practices. Next slide. Again, if you look across the country, what you see in common is an uptick at the right side of all of those graphs. Every single state is having a problem. Almost all of them are in the red now, meaning they're hot zones. There's a little orange, like Arizona is still in the orange because the numbers aren't that big yet, but they're significant. So the danger is the whole country is seeing a rise in cases. This, is, this was expected. Dr. Fauci spoke about it. Many health professionals, Dr. Cullen in our county knows that. I know it, Dr. Robbins knows it. But still, we have the ability to start to flatten that curve if we take all of the public health precautions very seriously and practice them. Next slide. Again, a, a graphic depiction of the surge in cases. If you look to the right, you can see how they've gone up consistently. Very, very concerning for all the reasons I've mentioned already and the president has as well. Next slide, please. The RT or R naught, which we report uh, weekly is a measure of transmissibility. And it's not an absolute number. It has to be considered in the context of a whole host of other public health metrics. What it tells us is we've moved up from the green zone where we were, which was below one, which is really, really ideal. And now we're starting to transmit more. The number is low, but still not low enough. Many places are higher than that around the country. We look at Pima County with a 168, we're below the county in general. And if we look at zip code 19, which is a zip code that the university is in, but not only the university, there's businesses here, people live here and so on, we're at 1.33. Now that's half of what it was the previous week. So we feel confident that some of our public health practices have been manifest in better numbers, but we are also very concerned of what, what's happening in the bigger environment. And this is continuing to spread in spite of these good practices. Next slide. Our CART deployment, we report every week and we are still concerned because although the 100 plus meetings have decreased, if you look across there on the cart, you'll see from 20 to 49, we have a plus five. From 50 to 99, we have a plus four. Total are plus seven positive. So what does that tell us? That tells us that there are still people in our community, in our university community, who are not taking this seriously. That they are meeting with their friends. They're not masking up. They're going to parties. They're going to social events which are the, the cause of the spread. We must, must do all we can to prevent the spread. And the president and the dean of students have taken this very seriously. ICS is monitoring it, why we have the CAR teams and appropriate uh, actions are being taken as far as discipline for those who violate 
what we say are the normal practices in order to keep our community safe. Next slide. So as we look at testing results here, uh, most recent by day, uh, three positives out of 782, that's pretty good. In the past 10 days, if we look at 76 out of 8,600 plus 0.9, pretty good. And if we look at total testing window from August of set almost 75,000 plus tests and 2,602 positive, 3.4. Those numbers are all good. But let me add, the bubble that we live in and the testing we're doing at the University of Arizona, we feel confident. And as the president pointed out, we're even doing more testing now that the numbers are good. But we are part of a larger community, Pima County. Pima County is part of a larger state where people move back and forth on a regular basis. So we can't rest on our laurels. We have to bear down, mask up, and even be tougher now because we see all the surging around us, including Pima County. These numbers are good, but not good enough. They need to keep getting better. Next slide. Over here, the COVID testing results. Again, you can look at the dashboard that's up there. The important thing here, you can see that our testing results look a little flat. We've bumped up a little bit recently, as the president pointed out. We still have to do more testing. We are resource depleted. We're testing as much as we can, but tests take time. Tests cost money. Uh, turnaround takes time. As the president often says, what we're working at, what many of the universities and, and researchers are working on, that mythical 10 minute, 10 cent test that we can get an instant response from where we can move to test every single day as part of Wildcat Checks. And that will help tremendously to be, to be able to identify those at risk and get them put, put into isolation and everybody else is safe at that point. You can hover over those blue bars as well. If you're interested, go on your computer and you'll be able to see the breakdown of that testing. I think it's worthwhile mentioning here, uh, uh, mentioning here that the county has been tremendous in being nimble and having testing around here at the university. You can uh, schedule testing and we encourage everybody, staff, faculty, students to test. But the county has added a number of walk-in testing sites that I think are at the Pima Community College campuses. And you can go to the Pima County website to get those, but those are walk-ins. There's no excuse for people not to get tested. Again, our goal is to continue to have better tests, faster tests, more efficient turnaround so that we can day to day be able to monitor. We're not there yet, but when you look at what we've done in the last nine months, we collectively, the nation, universities, the University of Arizona, innovation has just boomed here to answer these unmet needs and it continues to do so. Next slide. Bobby, I think that, um, that summarizes where we are. And I know you're as concerned as I am in our incident command system as to um, leaning forward and being able to make sure we're doing everything we can here in the campus as good citizens, as part of a bigger community to keep it safe, but yet to let our students uh, continue to learn, our faculty and staff continue to work. You know, there's the economics of this, there's the educational aspect of this, but boy, we're surrounded by a nation that is struggling and divided around these issues, Bobby. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, the one thing that that I would say is, as things uh, continue to get worse, um, we're we're only about a week away uh, to getting to that November twenty fifth date, where uh, all of our classes will then be offered online to finish out this uh, term, and then we'll have about six weeks of a break, and it'll be very interesting to watch what happens nationwide with all the travel and all the family gatherings that are uh, part of these holiday celebrations, uh, I think we have to continue to message just like we do here. Um, small gatherings, you, you have no idea unless everybody in your family pod is tested. Uh, you don't know if they're gonna be positive and you can get a spreader event uh, just, just in normal, sharing a meal uh, at, at the holiday time. So I'm anticipating there's gonna be some sort of push for, for a national policy. What we, what we really need to do is just um, really bear down and mask up until we can get the vaccine. And uh, that's gonna be an important timetable. We, we got some more new good news about one of the other vaccine uh, companies that 
Uh, it's almost 95% effective in the trials that have been done. Uh, uh, good news that it can last for up to 30 days and only has to be stored at minus 20, which is uh, a good, new, good news for the distribution and supply chain. But we, we're still gonna have to be in this mode for the entire semester. And I would say that uh, so far, uh, as the numbers bear out, we, we, uh, we're doing quite well uh, at the University of Arizona. And now the community around us uh, is seeing a surge. So I would, would stress that for our university com community, stay as much in this sort of, sort of semi-permeable uh, bubble that we have and just kind of focus on, as, as you said earlier, Rich, um, really uh, stay at stay inside your dorm and only go out to those absolutely necessary things, the occasional class, go to the pharmacy, to a doctor's appointment, obviously get food, but kind of limit in and focus on getting ready for your finals and get through this semester. It's been a uh, it seems like a blink of an eye from August 24th to where we are now, but it's been a long, tough uh, semester with a lot of hard work. And, and I would say we're, we're really only approaching halftime. Uh, we've got a whole uh, semester in the spring. Um, there there uh, are going to be preparations. We're going to do even more testing, if you can believe that, in the spring term. So um, we're gonna continue to, uh, to mitigate and try to make it as safe as possible, but uh, it's our own personal actions of doing the, the things that we have said, I think in every one of these press briefings, cover your face. This is probably the best technology we have right now. And it's effective, uh, not only the CDC is uh, modified and said, not only does it pre prevent you from spreading droplets, but as some of these masks have gotten, uh, I know uh, some of the ones that we gave to our students, faculty and staff at the start of the term are water resistant. And the CDC has uh, acknowledged that it even protects you. So if everybody would just cover their face, stay as far away from as many people as possible and wash their hands, we'd go a long way. Um, so, uh, Rich, any, any observation? One, one last thing I would say is I think there's starting to be some pushback from certain states. Uh, even my uh, home of origin state, Mississippi, said we're not going to uh, comply with any national orders. We're, we're going to do what we're going to do. That's not helpful. Uh, I think we all have to get on board because we travel from Mississippi to Georgia and Georgia to California and California to Arizona, um, even by car. So we just have to take this seriously. And my hope is that the vaccine will be available uh, maybe uh, late spring, early summer, but I, I'm, I'm still concerned we won't have the vaccine on our campuses and we'll be in this uh, COVID mitigation phase, even certainly through the spring semester and even into fall semester next year. Bobby, I'd, I'd agree with you. I, I, you know, with our multiple, all our conversations, I share your concerns as does our incident command system, but um, it might be worthwhile. Um, first of all, I want to give a shout out to our public health advisory team uh, and our scientists here our immunologists who have come up with some of the best tests available in the country from our antibody test, our antigen test, and now working on that swish gargle test that, uh, that is a lot easier to do. Uh, so uh, because of these challenges, it, it spawns innovation. And innovation is alive here at the University of Arizona because of that, as well as many of the campuses around the country that you and I have the opportunity to speak with the presidents we know and the leadership in those universities. Everybody's in the lab trying to figure out how to fix this. So between our public health advisory team, the scientists, wastewater, immunology, I mean, we've been on the cutting edge of so many changes that have helped us, but also we've been able to share with other universities and other communities so that they can, they can be safe. The challenge, of course, as, as you point out, is we're still a nation divided. 
when we need to come together. We're at war, as you said before. This is, a, this is an invisible enemy who has permeated every part of our society and disrupted it. And yet the mask becomes a political issue for some people. Social distancing becomes a political issue. That is absolutely unacceptable. You know, this is, you know, I, the, 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 I guess that it pains me to see my country struggling through this because I, I think in the Second World War, when we went to war because there was an identifiable enemy, we went to war as Americans, not as Republicans or Democrats or independents. We went to war as Americans. We need to face this challenge as Americans and stop this political tomfoolery that has nothing to do with the health, safety, or security of the nation. You know, to your point, and I'm just, you know, I'm really fed up with it because people are dying because of this, you know, and people are suffering irreparable harm. We need to come together, put down our differences across the board, whether it's Mississippi, New York, California, it doesn't make a difference. Put all that stuff aside. Let's get better. So then we can argue about our political differences where we're all better. And we sit around a table, hopefully, in a friendly, diplomatic fashion, exchange information, and deal with the problems of the day. But we're never going to be able to do that unless we get through this war. And yeah, I, I would agree. And, and we had probably, I think, the most productive public health advisory team meeting this past week. Terrific. And our experts are challenging uh, you and me that we talk about, we look at the data, but what are we doing about it? Well, what we're doing about it is we're continuing to um, give the message to bear up, mask down, wash your hands, stay away from as many people as possible, consistent. Uh, we're amping up our testing. We're going to expand it in the spring term. We're going to require more testing for those individuals that come on campus. And uh, if we see that there are uh, increased cases on campus, we will we will adjust and we will go back to phase one and maybe even phase zero. If it gets as bad as it looks like it's headed toward, uh, we may be back to where we were in the spring last year, spring break. I hope we're not uh, headed toward another spring break like we had last year, um, because I think we've taken this seriously. We put in mitigation uh, maneuvers and policies and protocols and I hope we can get uh, through it, but we, we're approaching a very much needed break uh, when people can uh, take some time away from the university and, and kind of recharge and regroup for that second half push in the second semester. Yeah, so yeah. Holly, I don't, I'm not sure if we've got questions, but Rich, you got one final statement before we take questions? I think it's uh, worthwhile mentioning, history is the prologue to our future. And if you want to see what happened, how a pandemic was mismanaged, look at many of the books that are out about the 1918 pandemic. If you change the dates on, the, on, the, on those reports from 1918, it's here today. Fighting about masks, fighting about politics, which party is right, which party is wrong, uh, favoring the economy over the health. And, those, and again, those were the, the same debates we're having today they had back then. And what we see is that when communities didn't adhere to those public health practices and they went forward in spite of public health information that the pandemic was prolonged. San Francisco is a perfect example going back 102 years ago. And that pandemic lasted two and a half, three years, you know, until it cleared. And yet they didn't have the technology. They didn't have the understanding of viruses or germs or pathogens. They didn't have the distribution network for content which can be positive, but also can be negative with all of the conspiracy theories and the craziness that gets put out there that confuses the average person in America. So I would, I would close by saying, as you look at things and you're not sure if they're true, fall back on, on sources of information that you can trust. Go to the NIH, go to CDC, go to University of Arizona, places that don't have a political gain, but places that will tell you the truth even though it may be politically incorrect, they will tell you the truth as how to make the best decisions for you and your family. Okay, Holly. I'm ready. Our first question comes from Craig Smith at KGON 9. Go ahead, Craig. Hi, um, I'm gonna ask kind of a multi-part question. Uh, as you watch the, the numbers trend in a bad direction, 
Uh, you already talked about going back to perhaps uh, at least the possibility of the way things were in the spring. Are there any steps that you've considered but are still sort of in the background as possible for you to use? Uh, any, any other steps you haven't tried yet that you, that you may try? Um, the other is uh, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I missed last week and I'm looking for a little clarity as to what changed uh, that made you feel that you did have the legal authority to require testing for non-dorm residents where before you had said, no, you didn't. Yeah, Craig, good points. I think the thing that I, only thing that I can think of is changing is continuing to pound this message of good public hygiene but testing everybody every day. We're not quite there yet, but I see uh, the possibility of certainly increasing testing. And it, in, uh, with regard to the legal question, I think that um, uh, those, those issues uh, have been resolved, at least in my mind, in speaking with our, our attorneys, that if uh, individuals come onto our campus in the classroom, we can require testing. Now, uh, that means if we stay at phase two, there are about 12,000 individuals who come uh, in person on campus. And so we would have to ramp up our testing to a minimum of, if let's say uh, hypothetically, we would do testing once a week. So that would be ramping up to uh, about 2,500 to 3,000 tests per week. Uh, and I think this new uh, test that uh, Dr. Carmona uh, talked about is not quite ready for prime time yet, but I think that we're going to be able to at least get everyone who comes on campus tested at least once a week. M the thing that I would change if I could, Craig, and I, and I know we're working feverishly to get there would be test everybody every day. And uh, I think it's going to be a race of technology to uh, whether the, the vaccine uh, gets widely distributed before we're be, we'll be able to test everybody every day. But this is not the last pandemic, as we've said this over and over. And I think uh, having this innovation and in, uh, uh, testing technology uh, developed here at the university it's going to help us with this pandemic, but puts us in good position for whatever is coming uh, in the future. Now, uh, did you earlier? Did you just have an, an, an assumption that you didn't have the legal leverage before, and, and then you got advice to the contrary? And I have a, and also, uh, I'm sort of really stacking the questions here. Also, um, does the U of A have a pipeline to any of these vaccine suppliers and are you prepared to be a vaccine administration site? Yeah, the first uh, answer was we knew we had the legal authority if uh, our students signed a contract and live in our dorm, they had to adhere to the testing policies. Um, and uh, frankly, I was a little reluctant to uh, because I didn't know how we could mandate it uh, for off campus. Uh, but now if they come in the classroom, uh, then uh, we feel pretty confident we can require them to be tested. I'm sure there's going to be uh, pushback against that, but we're going to hold firm to that policy. Uh, but as I said in my preamble and opening remarks, if you're a student and uh, you're not coming on campus, then uh, we're not going to require that you be tested. If you're in Sierra Vista and you never go uh, around people and doing all your classes uh, online or you live in Omaha or whatever, we're not going to require testing because it becomes uh, uh, a bit of a logistic uh, problem to try to track all that. And it's just it's defeating the purpose. What we're trying to do is uh, avoid these large gatherings on campus. We don't want to be part of the problem. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that we're not seeing these large gatherings of 100 people. I am concerned that we're pos uh, positive seven, as Rich uh, pointed out in, in his data review, that people are still gathering. Um, and this is where thing, the, the virus gets spread, not in the classroom, because I think 
Chris Kopech, his team, uh, Provost Liesel Folks, uh, the whole academic team has done a great job of while you're in the classroom, you're going to have your face covered, you're going to gel in, gel out, and you're going to be appropriately distanced in the classroom. Um, but it's the activities outside the classroom where there's a problem. And frankly, it's just through education and more testing are the only things that I think that uh, we can do to try to mitigate. Holly, you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Um, our next question comes from Austin Walker from KVOA. Go ahead, Austin. Hey, everybody, good morning. My first question was kind of about um, the mandatory testing, like you just said, how, um, but I think that was kind of answered at first. John Judas said that you, the university said it was unconstitutional to mandate testing for every, per city council meeting to mandate testing for every single student. And then now you just kind of cleared up that it was just for those who are living on campus or um, try, or you are going to go on uh, to a class. But my next question is, well, what if um, a couple of students that we talked to said they live in the high rises or they live off campus, wherever it is, they still come onto campus to get a coffee, to go to, to, go to the gym, to, to do whatever it is. They need to do so what if a student just wants to go get a coffee on campus um, why would we not want to mandate testing for every single student regardless if they live on or off campus yeah it's a good point austin and i i think where we've been focused the most is uh in the classroom uh and frankly protecting our uh faculty uh teaching assistants uh the staff who have to go in and clean those areas I think if they want to come on campus, just like the public can, uh, to get a coffee at the bookstore. You know, when I was uh, in the bookstore, uh, it's open, people come in and out. I think they do a really good job of making sure you gel in before you go in and requiring that your face be covered and stay physically distanced when you're inside there. Uh, most of the uh, food services in the union are trying to do grab and go and having outside area dining. And we know if you're outside, uh, it's better than being inside. Because again, this is a game of, uh, of physics and physical distancing uh, matters and outdoor circulation matters. So it's a good point, but I think that uh, we're trying to incrementally aggress and, uh, address as many issues as possible and in the classroom is where our professors and staff have been most concerned in those close quarters in the classroom. So that's where we're going to uh, uh, increase the testing requirements. Unmute, unmute again. Um, our next question comes from Chris Conover for, from AZPM. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, question on the testing. You said it's ramping up. Um, and Dr. Carmona, I, I thought I understood you to say, but I may have been incorrect in hearing you say that resources are getting a little tight for testing on campus. Is that correct? And, and how are things looking as testing needs to ramp up in the spring? Bobby, you want to start or should I? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So um, we've, we've always... Uh, been on the edge of resources uh, because we pushed our teams to test as many people as we possibly could. Uh, but I think with the pooling that Rich has talked about over this uh, last several weeks and this new uh, swish and gargle test that will be uh, easier to administer, it can be done at kiosk in dorms so that we get higher compliance rate uh, in the high rises, we can have these pop-up kiosks and you simply uh, take some saline, gargle, uh, put it in a tube and we think through pooling, we can lower the, um, the cost of those tests and the turnaround. If, if we can get people to test before 10 a.m., which is always a big uh, struggle with our students getting up and getting downstairs, but it's almost like, go do that before you, you get breakfast. Uh, we can have, have those back same day, and that would be a game changer. That's a PCR technology, and we're very excited about it. I still am focused on this 10-second, 10-cent uh, test. 
both um, Arizona State and our researchers here are uh, working on, on a iPhone-based uh, test that would allow people to test every day and you simply show, uh, you know, I tested negative and you can get into class or you can go to a sporting event and that would be a game changer, but we're not quite ready for that yet. My hope is that it would be ready for prime time sometime in the spring semester and certainly hope that it'd be available uh, by fall term. Dr. Carmona, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think uh, the president uh, answered it appropriately. Uh, maybe I will just say that uh, to Chris, um, my remarks were, we are, as the president said, we're pushing the envelope as much as we can based on the tests that we can get. And so, and it's limited by the, you know, whether it's antibody, antigen, or the PCR test, but you need people to do that. You need machines to do that. And we have just, uh, you know, moved heaven and earth to make sure that we can continue. And as you've seen with the president's remarks this morning, we have increased our testing significantly. So that's what I was referring to, that in a perfect world, we would love to teach, uh, test everybody every day. And that would be part of the Wildcat app, as the president just alluded to. We're not there yet, but that would be our ultimate goal. I, I, I would also say, uh, put a uh, plug in for our antibody tests. It, it still remains relevant. And I would encourage people to seek out antibody testing because that gives us some sense of who's had the infection. Uh, my sense is that our number of cases uh, has been about two to 3% on campus while uh, the state of Arizona and, and Pima County are approaching the, you know, sort of 10% level of positivity. And my sense is there've been a lot of students uh, who've had this infection and that we, uh, we found what almost 3,000 of our students who have been infected through our testing, uh, through antigen or PCR testing. But I would love to see everybody get multiple antibody tests and those are relatively less expensive and uh, very, very accurate. It'll also allow us to know which uh, individuals have antibodies and will help guide the administration of vaccines. Okay, we have a couple of follow, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Carmona. I just wanted to add uh, a plug for our researchers here. One of the few places in the country that's actually looking at how long, the, how long immunity lasts. So that antibody test starts to tell us, in fact, our researchers have published a paper recently showing how, what at least early on uh, at the uh, immunity lasts. And why is that important? Well, if we have a cohort of students, for instance, or faculty that we know are immune, even if it's for six months, we can have them do a lot of things that we otherwise wouldn't have them do. And they can populate the businesses, they can go to work, they can go to school. So we're looking ahead as to how we can use that information as well, because we still haven't clearly defined how long immunity lasts. And that ties into the vaccine, because maybe we need a booster for some people. That goes right into the next follow-up from uh, Craig Smith. Go ahead, Craig. Uh, yeah, so I was asking, do you have a, um, does, does U of A have a pipeline or are you working towards a pipeline to, uh, to have a source of vaccine? And might you end up being a vaccination site for the university community and perhaps community at large? Yeah, Craig, I forgot to answer that second part of your question earlier. I apologize for that. Yeah, we've been working very, uh, I was texting with uh, the mayor and vice mayor early this morning and we, we've been working with uh, Dr. Cullen and uh, the county health department around uh, setting up a freezer farm, uh, exactly how, because there are multiple different companies, right? Uh, Pfizer requires minus 80 degree storage. So we, we think we'll have enough uh, capacity for, if you think of our community as 60,000 people and requiring a booster, uh, we, we're going to easily have the capability to store 120,000 doses at minus 80 degrees with a, with a freezer farm that Chris Kopak and his team and ICS and Dr. Dake and their team have worked out. Moreover, uh, you know, minus 80 degree freezers aren't uh, ubiquitous. Uh, most people have never seen one. 
So we are working with Dr. Cullen in the county to be a, um, a repository and a storage site for all of Pima County as well. And we're working closely with them. It's good news about uh, 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 the uh, Moderna um, test that requires only minus negative because those are easier freezers to, uh, to find and less expensive. And that the, um, the vaccine would be viable and uh, safe and effective up to 30 days outside once you thaw it out. Um, I think for the Pfizer uh, vaccine, it's only five days. So it makes uh, the supply chain and logistical issues a lot easier to get the vaccine out. And, and I would just say parenthetically that this is really a, a, um, a triumph of science. This is the fastest any vaccine will have ever been developed in the history of humankind. Uh, moreover, it's not an attenuated uh, killed virus like measles and chickenpox and other things. Uh, it's a genetically engineered uh, messenger RNA vaccine. So I, I think we should all um, feel confident that uh, the scientific community is working hard to try to protect all of us and get the economy back open. Rich, I saw your hand go up. I just wanted to add, Bobby, uh, something that we've talked about, uh, the issue of the vulnerable populations, not the ones that we talk about generally, which are our senior citizens who have comorbidities, you know, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, things like that but the other vulnerable populations, which are people of color, which tend to have a higher incidence of disease and mortality that's higher. We reported on that months ago, very early on. Other of our colleagues around the country have seen it and validated that. And the reason I bring it up, when you look at our state with seven and a half or so million people, and you look at how many are in urban centers, half of them are in a rural area. So when you start to think, how do I get them vaccinated? How about on the Indian reservations where it may be hundreds of miles away from a freezer. So though the logistics of this is amazingly complex and really the only people in the country who have the ability to engage in logistics of this magnitude are the military. And in fact, the US Army, uh, General Parna is the uh, lead on that for the United States. And he has a team working 24 seven now as these vaccines are ready, depending on which vaccine, logistics changes. As Bobby pointed out, if it's the Pfizer one, we've got these freezers, the freezer farm is being put in, we may end up being a distribution network for a wider uh, geographic area. If it's some of the others, you don't need those freezers, that changes the dynamics of distribution as well for the supply chain. So those are all things that are on our radar, not only for the U of A, but us looking at the community at large and the state at large and even the region as to how we can contribute to solve a bigger problem. We have one final follow-up from Austin from KVOA. Go ahead, Austin. Great, thank you so much. This is a two-parter. Um, I do wanna then just kind of ask the first the first part. Um, so do you stand by the claim of, about the testing of all students for mandatory testing um, from John Duda saying that it is unconstitutional to test all students from the University of Arizona? Well, I, I'm not sure about the constitutionality of it because uh, I do think there will be uh, obviously um, certain exemptions that can be made that would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. But I, I do think that if um, students are gonna come in our classrooms uh, that we, we should be able to, to test them. Now, for students who are not coming to campus, uh, I, I think, you know, th there's limited resources. And so what we're doing is trying to protect our faculty, staff, teachers, and other students. When we are inside, um, you know, we, we've been big proponents of having classes outdoors. Uh, even though it's getting cooler now, I think it's probably going to be 90 this week, at least for a couple of days, and it'll cool back off. But, but these are just basic public health hygiene issues. If we can keep people as far away as possible, continue to cover their face and make sure they uh, sanitize their hands and we test frequently, we identify people, we contact trace them, 
then we isolate them if they're positive. If we did those six things, um, we could get through uh, get through this uh, semester uh, and uh, the the entire year. I would say it's been working so far. We haven't seen a lot of people who've gotten uh, really ill. Uh, we haven't seen the hospitals overrun, but as Dr. Carmona keeps emphasizing, we're entering into uh, a season when people from uh, Northern uh, regions uh, find Tucson to be compelling to come and spend the, the winter with us because it's milder. And, uh, you know, we're going to see more people in the hospital, more people in ICUs for non-COVID related things, but it, it, it blocks the uh, capability of having uh, ICU and, and, and hospital beds in general. Uh, and just like we saw back in the summer, I think Rich is, is correctly pointed out, uh, we just can't get, a, we can have beds, but we don't have the qualified nurses, technology, uh, technologists and support staff to be able to keep these beds open. So thankfully, uh, most of the cases we've seen, almost 3,000, nobody has gotten really severely ill. I only know of one uh, student who was even hospitalized and that was out of an abundance of caution for, for that uh, individual. So, um, you know, I, I think our system is working. We will continue to be dedicated to um, being on the cutting edge uh, and doing everything we possibly can to, uh, to keep the educational uh, opportunities open for our students, um, while at the same time trying to protect everyone. We have one, one more follow-up, and this comes back from Chris Conover from AZPM, and this is regarding Ashford, President Robbins. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, quick question. Uh, I saw the announcement that the Ashford deal is, is basically uh, wrapped up now. There was a lot of concern when it was first announced from Eller and, and some faculty members that this was not a good thing. Have you been able to allay those concerns? Well, I, I think that uh, things have been, been moving forward. Um, the uh, accrediting body approved the accreditation. Uh, so we're, we're pleased with that. And I think, I think that as we've uh, described uh, how things will, uh, will roll out in our relationship with University of Arizona Global Campus, I think there, there's a lot of uh, comfort in um, how, we, how we will uh, operate with the, the new university, which will be a not-for-profit. We have an academic affiliation agreement. There's a new board that, is, um, that will be uh, announced later this week. The, the names uh, and the, the official seating of that board will take place in, uh, during this week. And then the deal will close and um, the university will change over from being known as Ashford University to the University of Arizona Global Campus. Um, there are gonna be critics uh, in, who still oppose this deal but I think on balance for the good, long-term good of uh, these students that we seek to serve and for the University of Arizona, uh, it's gonna be accretive to our mission as a land-grant university. And, and I think as people understand the incredible opportunities, even some of the Eller professors and others who've uh, been critical of this deal uh, at the outset, uh, are beginning to understand there's some real possibilities for collaboration and educational opportunities. So I, I'm confident that as time goes on, um, this will be proven to be a, a correct decision, um, but we're, we're continuing to, to work very hard to make sure that uh, the academic affiliation with uh, U of A uh, Global Campus is one that um, everyone understands and will be comfortable in that framework. Uh, and there's gonna be an important transition for those pr prospective students who have seen uh, the Ashford brand is one that 
was very attractive to them. I mean, 35,000 students. So there's going to be that transition between what does this mean? We think that being affiliated with the University of Arizona is going to be something that will be very attractive for, for these adult, adult learner uh, students that um, just don't have time to come to a residential campus and find uh, the University of Arizona being involved with this opportunity is one that um, they'll see in a positive light. Moreover, um, I think it will help us uh, to have pathways toward other programs, whether it's Eller or uh, other programs. I know our uh, Applied Science and Technology campus at Sierra Vista, that college uh, looks on this deal as being very favorable. Um, and, and I look forward to exploring ways that our faculty members can, uh, can work with the Ashford, uh, soon to be global campus faculty members in a positive way. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have today. We have a hard stop of 10 and we made it exactly at 10. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And as always, President Robbins. Yeah, I have one question. Are we are we having a briefing next Monday? Um, I think that's our last briefing um, until post Thanksgiving. And then we'll do one um, at the beginning of December and then take that entire rest of the month off until the beginning of January. Okay, well, as always, just remember, bear down and mask up.